Good evening. My name is Rosita Chitanda, and I am the founding president of the Coalition and Alliance for Urban School Educators. Our show tonight is called Drinking from the Lights Only Fountain. We're talking about education issues and the impact of education historically for those who are were descendants of slaves. Tonight we want to just examine what is going on nationwide with teachers, parents, and students, primarily in African American communities. Um, we have a group of people, and our co-hosts will be calling in very shortly. And her name is Nikki, and she will be talking to us about education issues and things that are going on nationally as well. First of all, I would like to talk a little bit about the issues that we're very concerned with, and that is the mass termination of African American teachers nationwide. In an article from The Nation, it quotes that thousands of black teachers have lost their jobs nationwide. And that's one of the things. This article was written by Gray Topo from USA Today. And he talks about it, about the, that in the spring of 1953 with the Board of Education, Brown versus the Board of Education desegregation case, that was pending in the U.S. Supreme Court. Wendell Godwin, superintendent of the schools in Topeka, sent letters to the black elementary school teachers, particularly polite letters that couldn't mask the message. If segregation dies, you will lose your job. So we're looking at it from a historical perspective, and we're going to go all the way back to the beginning when African Americans were transported over to America and over to South America for the purposes of slavery. Since our inception in this country, education and quality education has always been the forbidden fruit for African Americans. We are uh, have been struggling with this issue for over 400 years. Every generation has had its issues in regards to education. In the beginning, slaves were not allowed to read, and as we know, there were very punitive measures uh, implemented for those who decided to drink from the whites only fountain. And this is why we call our show Drinking from That Fountain, because education has always been the forbidden fruit for our people in this country. So if we fast forward and we talk about issues regarding education when African Americans were slaves, and then we look at post-slavery issues in regards to education. Well, of course, we had Jim Crow law, and then we had the separate but equal facilities, and then we had the Brown versus Board of Education that I referred to before. And in our generation, something has happened, and all of the gains that we made to secure quality education for our students, for our community, for parents, have somehow been undermined. And that's what we want to talk about today. So um, those issues uh, today are uh, the issues that we're struggling with today have to do with turnaround school closures. Uh, we even have issues regarding the way that African American teachers have really been relegated to positions very similar to those of the help, if you saw the movie The Help. 
And you saw the way that the women in the community who were the providers and who provided economic security for the community, for their children, and the conditions that they had to work in are very similar to what teachers are going through today. So uh, I'm just waiting to hear from some of our our co-hosts if they're on the line. We're waiting for you to push one because we want to hear from you, Nikki. And we also want to hear from anyone else who has issues regarding education. We want to hear from, um, there's a young lady that's calling in about school closings. I went to the Board of Education meeting today and uh, we just had a group of people that were there because they, after closing 50 schools in Chicago last year, turning around seven more, and I'm just going to explain what turnarounds are, and then if there's anyone that would like to speak, I'd like to hear from you. Turnarounds are situations where they go in and they actually fire everyone in the building, the teachers, the um, administrators, the lunch people, and also the custodian. Now, they fire all of these people because they say the scores are low and the school is failing. We don't understand why people who are being fired, who actually have nothing to do with educating children. This is a big question for us. What does the lunch lady have to do with the school score? What does the, and that's the question for our audience, what do you think about our turnaround? So I'm waiting to hear, is there someone on the line that would like to speak to those issues? Okay, are we listening to Francis? Hello? Do we have anyone on the line? Hello? Hello? Yes, who's on the line? Yes. Francis. Great. Oh, this is our parent uh, chair for our Coalition and Alliance for Urban School Educators here in Chicago. And uh, she is a parent and has 10 children. And some of them are still in the school system. I'd like to hear, uh, we were talking, Francis, about drinking from the whites only fountain. And I picked that name because that is, uh, that is an issue with education over the course of the last 400 years. We consider education for our community to be the forbidden fruit. It is uh, a thing denied, actually denied to our people. And I wanted to hear from you at the, if you would share to us some of your experiences that you've had here in Chicago. Um, you mean just with the school? Yes, with the school and what you, today I went to the board meeting on another group of turnaround schools, which of course, they voted to shut these schools down. Uh, right. We want to talk about what that means when they turn around schools and they fire not only the teaching staff, administrators, but something very sinister when you fire the lunch lady. And when you, there's something else going on with that picture, and I just wanted to hear what you thought about that. Um, about... Uh, about the right, right. About the the, the turnaround. Um, 
you know, I don't know, Rosie. I, I really had a long day, and I'm kind of tired, so I guess. But I was just trying to listen in, but I, I wasn't really sure. But the turnaround. Well, what, just share with what us anything you, you'd like to share with us regarding your experience with education here. Oh, uh, well, you know, our, our children, we were pleased with the school that they were in last year, but they closed mm-hmm. it. And it was one of the better schools. And that, that, was that a turnaround or is it was closure? Um, you know what, this one was a little different. They, it was a closure, but then they brought another school into that building and changed a the charter. name. A charter? No, it's a regular oh, okay. public, uh, it was like a, well, it really wasn't a merger. It was, they closed Williams and then brought Drake into the building where Williams originally was. Okay. So, so this you know, is but, an, Yes, this is an entirely different kind of closure. But basically, let me just explain to people that the closure, uh, when they say they're closing schools, they're actually doing school action. And there are six different, or I believe six or seven different ways to close a school. And Francis is talking about one of the unique ways where they just close the school and then bring some other school in, dis- displace the students. Uh, in, in this particular case at Williams, was what was so interesting. Williams is located in a housing project, one of the few that is still standing. And they are, uh, the children who actually live in those projects were denied access to the building. So, of course, the enrollment was very, very low. And right. that's because the children who lived there were not permitted to enroll in the school. And they lived across the street. Not It wasn't even across the street because of the way the building is structured. It was right in front of their building. And they would have to travel long distances to uh, attend school maybe an hour, 40 minutes away driving, an hour on the bus when there was a school right there. So um, I would just like to, you know, we, to talk about some of the things that are related to these closing. For two, what actually happened uh, for you uh, can you tell us about the difficulty as a parent when you're having a school that closed? Right. So we had to decide if we were going to allow her to continue to attend that school, <clears throat> even though uh, they brought in another group of children and new teachers, mm-hmm. and we just and we were going to we were going to let her stay there because her friends were there, but then she decided herself to just go to our neighborhood school, which is a couple blocks away. And it was her eighth grade year, so she had been there. It was a middle school from six to eight. So it was mm-hmm. a really big, uh, it was a big disruption for her. Mm-hmm. But, but, I mean, but there was a small group of parents who tried to fight for the school, but it was it, there wasn't enough outcry from the from the community to keep the school open, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things when I was at the board meeting today is uh, how the, the young African-American parents, like you said, they in many ways are being organized to work against the community because what we have in Chicago, we have an organization called AUSL, and I think it's Academy for Urban School Leadership. And the AUSL um, um, director, he's also, or was director, or board member, he is also the board president for CPS. And so he has a contract, which I don't know if it's a conflict of interest, 
But it seems like if you're the president of the, of the Board of Education and then you have a contract with the Board of Education to go in and you're entitled to five, six schools a year. I'm not sure the nature of the contract, but this person is entitled to go in and the thing of it is, all 90 99% of the schools closed are in the African American community. So he's allowed to have a contract. So when was this contract pay. signed? And how how so he can just close? So he doesn't even have. This doesn't have to be voted on. This is already understood that he can get so many schools every year. Is that how the AUSL every contract year. works? Yes, and oh. that's why they call it a contract school. So he has the ability oh. to every year, no matter what happens, this is why the turnarounds are not going to stop. We don't know when his contract is. It could be 50 years, it could be 20 years, like the parking meters. We don't know how long this contract will be in effect, but he has the right through this contract school to take five or six of our schools in the African American community, now they're moving more towards some of the Hispanic schools, and turn them around, turning them around and compasses, firing everyone in the building. The teaching staff really doing a clean sweep, which right. they're saying to the only people they keep are the students. And then, in some cases, they can be selective as to who they keep. So when they go in, these students don't know anyone in the building. And right. with a USL, the, the veteran teachers, they might keep one teacher. Well, they're, they're, the way that they do this, and I don't know why they do this, they may keep one teacher. And it's usually someone who hasn't taught long and someone who's a novice. And then they, when they hire, they really don't hire many African-American teachers because the pressure from the community in the last couple of years, they've started to hire more. But they have an AUSL Academy and teachers go there to be trained on how to teach and how to deal with these very these inner city at-risk children. So, this is troubling. It is very troubling because doing a clean sweep of a building and taking people's jobs who are not responsible in any way uh, in terms of the academic su success of the school. So this is another issue and um, I wanted to see if Nikki was on the line yet because we were waiting. I'm glad you called in, Francis, so we'll continue to talk. Uh, okay. We need... Hi, Nikki, are you there? Yes, yeah, I'm here. I'm I on. want you... Oh, wonderful. I want you to join in and just tell us from, the ne from a national perspective. We were talking about some of the things that are going on in Chicago. We know about New Orleans, and we know that in New Orleans they had seven to 8,000 teachers that were terminated as a result of the, the post-Katrina episode. And then okay. we realized we talked to teachers in Detroit. And Detroit right. is basically decimated. So go ahead and tell us what you know. Well, I think what we can see, even if we were not doing the re reading at the research, but for the last petitions that we've put out, so we are saying it's an issue at a big proportion. Because we have so far like 360 people from all over the country saying how they were treated as... Uh, so, I mean, if somebody is not in a lab, I call the university, the academic doing research, no, they sit in a lab. So, if, I don't know if they've seen the numbers, but we've seen it in the last uh, few days, like, you know, how people are, are, are gone. But if you look at the, 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 the comments, I'm not seeing too many people from Boston, from Massachusetts. I think I only, I only see one person, I think he's from a suburb, and it, it, it looks like, it sounds like a, a Caucasian who's saying that 
there has to be equity. Like on uh, African American teachers have to be treated equally. So in the New England area, I'm not. I'm being honest with you. I'm not hearing anything. I'm just reading. So I'm not hearing anybody. So I just read in the papers, like in Connecticut, how they don't have enough. Uh, 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 minority, not only teachers. I mean, now we can we we are going to we talking about teachers, but if we look at uh, police officers, firefighters, mm-hmm. I'm saying all the good jobs that you know minority, especially black people, can be on the middle class some status. So all those city jobs, all those federal jobs, so we don't having them. So it's not only. I mean, we're gonna we are talking about teachers now, but once everybody starts talking together, everybody who you know doesn't have jobs, everybody who's being laid off. Look at Montgomery County in in um. Montgomery County, in the uh-huh. city Baltimore area. So most of those people who are laid off by the federal government are, are African American. So I mean, we are being wiped out of the middle class. So we got to put our yes, heads exactly, up. exactly. Oh, and I just want to jump in and say this, Nikki, because what Nikki is talking about is the public sector jobs. So because yes. we're talking about education and education uh, locally, it's a, a public sector job. And if we go yeah. back to drinking from the whites only fountain, the reason why blacks historically are working in public sector jobs is because many educated blacks were discriminated against from the previous generation in private sector jobs. So you have an overwhelming amount of black people who are middle class who work in public sector jobs. Now what is happening is that those jobs are now being privatized. And with privatization, we have people that have historically discriminated against African American in mass in the workplace and now mm-hmm. they have control over all of the public sector jobs. And they're doing mm-hmm. mass uh, firing, mass, they're making decisions to completely eliminate the black middle class. Yes. So yes. one yes. of the People things have- I, wanted, I wanted to refer to uh, the link because we put out a petition and Nikki did a very good job uh, if you go on change.org and if you can sign our petition, you, if you type in cause, coalition, and alliance of urban school educators, our petition for, will come up and it is asking the U.S. government to investigate the mass firing of African American teachers. We're asking the U.S. Department of Justice. One of the things that we're asking, it is not just the turnaround and the, that, that trouble us and the closures, because like I said, there are six or seven different types of closures that they're using in Chicago. But in addition okay. to school closing, they have instances where teachers are brought up on E3s, corrective action, or what we call given unsatisfactory rates. So yeah, in Chicago, mm-hmm. yeah, in Chicago, that number has skyrocketed uh, from yeah. having maybe five in 2005 unsatisfactory teachers, and now they're five or six hundred a year, and then. Of that five or six hundred, ninety percent are African American. The same is true for people who are brought up on charges. Eighty-five to ninety percent are African American, and now they only comprise fifteen percent of the teaching force. So you can uh, can you imagine that? It's the same yeah. thing with the student expulsions that we want to talk about too, which. Our children, in addition to the demonization of African American teachers, now we have our children who 76% of them are being, of the suspensions and expulsions are on African American children, primarily African American males. So I'm going to go back to you, Nikki. And it's, it's, what do you think about that? Uh, well, they've used uh, the, the 
period of fake bogus evaluation that we call like a corrective action. So for 20 years, you know, you were an excellent teacher. You know, you won prizes, you won awards for uh, uh, working above and beyond the call of duty. So I've had uh, awards and, you know, I present conferences. I write about the issues. I'm more like an ESL, ELL, ESO um, field. So for, for years, for 20 years, 25 years, you are good. And all of a sudden, you know, you cannot teach anymore. Even though you've written articles, you can write a book about teaching. You cannot, you cannot teach anymore. So that's um, you know, one of the ways you've done it. So I have um, a young man, right after he graduated from Harvard, who said that uh, there is no students for him. So he, is, um, he, he was downsized. And meanwhile, there was one lady, like a young white teacher, she had one kid under the guise of reading recovery. You know those reading recovery programs? You can have one child. Oh, yes. Mm-hmm. So she had one child, and this black kid, this black, young black man from Harvard, you know, there was nobody for him. So he, he just signed all the papers, and then he left. But, you know, but I didn't sign any paper. You didn't sign any paper. I didn't sign anything. So you did that to me also. Yeah. So I'm incompetent. I don't know how to teach. You know, even though the, 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 the person who's evaluated me never taught ESL, and when he came, when she came to my class, she was asking me, can I see the teacher's guide to see if you are teaching the proper way? I said, you know, I want to tell you know, everything. But anyway, <laughs> sorry. So he's, uh, so and, she... And also... Oh, also, you talked about the advocacy for, in my case, I mean, they wanted to expel seven of my students and the principal. And when I began to advocate for these children and explain to the principal yeah. that I really could not, you know, I could not in my own conscience expel these kids. They were seventh and eighth graders. And I personally yeah. felt that they needed to be. After that, I began to get attacked by the principal. And then when uh-huh. some of the students who were very at risk would ask to act up and I would ask for help, she would refuse to give me help. And so yeah. I began to penalize because I, I, when I went to the expulsion hearing, I testified on behalf of the students. And on the way home, yeah. she said to me, I don't know why you're doing that. These kids need to be gone from here. And I was warned by CPS that I should be careful because uh, the principal was going to be very upset with me. And then she started attacking me. So, and uh, yep. it was, and, and in addition, another thing is how the use of violent students, and this is very serious, because what is being done to some teachers is they've been giving the most violent kids and the most at-risk kids, and when they don't uh-huh. want to comply with what the administration says, then those students are then used to literally attack the teacher. I've seen this done over and over again. These kind of strategies are being used. And I know it seems impossible, but, you know, I live in Chicago, and this is what I've witnessed here. Yes, some of those students have actually attacked the teachers, beat them up. They've done that. Uh Uh-huh. Well, we're getting ready to close. Was there anyone else on the line? I just want to say there's a turnaround rally for Gresham School. I'm not sure if someone's on the line for Gresham. 3.30 tomorrow, 98, and near Ashland. Look it up. I don't have the exact address. But there's going to be a big rally, and I'm encouraging everyone to come out. And as we close, as we close, drinking from the White's Only Fountain, we will be airing. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you to my guests, Nikki and Francis, and have a wonderful education day. Keep your Thank eyes you. open and ears open. Thank you. All right, good, good. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, okay, I'll, okay. thank you.